Hello, book burners, and welcome to Books Are Burning. I'm Mark Will in Taipei, and with me today is my guest and sometime co-author, G.J. Villa. How are you today, sir? Doing well. Happy to join you today from uh, here in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Very good. Well, our topic today is this excellent novel, or is it a novel? We'll discuss that later. But the book is called When We Cease to Understand the World by the Chilean author Benjamin Labatut. Uh, and uh, you're going to give us some background on Mr. Labatut in a minute. But uh, this book is organized into five sections. We have Prussian Blue, Schwarzschild Singularity, The Heart of the Heart, When We Cease to Understand the World, like the title track, and The Night Gardener. And today we will focus on Prussian Blue, that first section. Now, this is a book so fantastic that we feel we want to devote one episode to each section. I read it last year, and it was definitely one of the best books of 2022 for me, maybe the best book. Uh, I've now read it twice, and as we're preparing for these episodes, I'm rereading each of the five sections. Uh, tell us about your experience with the book. My experience was very similar. I've been a lifelong reader like you. Um, <clears throat> I read about this book and was immediately intrigued. I read it last year and was absorbed from page one. Uh, it was something strange. Uh, it had echoes of Roberto Bolaño, definitely W.G. Sebald. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a book with separate sections that interlock thematically and structurally, but there's not a straight singular story. And I was very intrigued by the way in which he takes historical figures, famous scientists and mathematicians, and tells the story of how their innovations in, in, in thinking transformed our conceptions of the world and essentially unlocked the perhaps ultimate unknowability of the world. I, I became fascinated by the author and, and looked up a series of interviews with him. He was, he's Chilean, but he spent some time in, he was born in uh, the Netherlands, I believe. He speaks multi, uh, several language. He speaks English fluently, so you can find interviews in English and Spanish. Um, and uh, he talks about his book. You know, it's a strange book about strange ideas that defy comprehension. Um, he immersed himself reading about black holes, quantum mechanics, and mathematical abstractions. And he says that he has a personal obsession with unknowability. And, and that to me was very, very interesting. Uh, the idea that ultimately one of the things the book is about is the way in which unknowability plagues the minds of these famous mathematicians, scientists, uh, uh, and leads them to the border of madness, essentially. Um, yeah. The notion that they get so deep into their new conceptions of the world that they start to slip away from what we would call common sense in any, any way. So it's, it's, it's a book about obsession, unknowability. Uh, Labatou talks about loving what he called, and I love this, 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 this phrase, the deranged landscapes of literature. Um, and he also expressed a disdain for traditional storytelling. He says, how can you tell a straight narrative in a world as twisted as ours? And so he's certainly doing that here in this book with these five separate sections. Each can stand alone in some ways, but together they form this incredible totality, if you will, right? Where he's exploring these notions of unknowability, ideas that defy comprehension, uh, the way that powerful abstract thinking can lead to madness. Um, and the final thing I'll say is that the book is drawing so much from history and what happened. And he says that his book is a work of fiction through and through, but that the fiction blooms expansively chapter to chapter. So Prussian Blue, what we'll examine today in depth, contains only one fictional paragraph, the final one. Everything else is 
he's taken all of these historical facts and anecdotes and, and, and he's woven them into this incredible tapestry. So everything is historical, but in terms of his role in that first section as the artist as a kind of weaver, he weaves together these different strands, historical strands, biographical strands, uh, strands about ideas. Um, he creates something incredibly unique, but whereas the first book, the first section, which we'll explore is in the register of an essay, right? Later on, we have, uh, you know, the novella, right? We have almost the, the allegory. So it's, it's, it's a strange book that defies genre, right? Um, yeah. And that's one of the things I found, one of the many things I found absolutely enthralling about it, that you really can't pin it down in terms of what this strange thing is. Well, there are several things you mentioned there I want to follow up on. Uh, first of all, if if this first section, Prussian Blue, is, as you say, an essay, it's certainly a very idiosyncratic kind of essay. You know, it. it I, I wonder if 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 that's the best description of it. You know, he says there's one fictional paragraph, meaning one paragraph that is pure invention. But I w I would argue that the way he, as you say, weaves these characters and their narratives together is in itself a kind of fictionalizing, you know? I mean, right. fiction fiction is something that is made, right? It's something that is created. Uh, so he's, he's definitely, uh, you know, approaching this material from the from the position of a uh, of the perspective of a, a highly skilled and sensitive literary artist, you know. Oh, agreed. I, I, I when I reread the book, and we both read it twice, and I've gone back to preparing for this chat and looked over passages and some notes I've taken. It really does compel you to to these deep dives. I kept coming back, at least with Prussian Blue the first section um, with the notion of the artist as a weaver, right? Um, okay. A kind of creative weaver. Um, the way in which he weaves in historical facts throughout the chapter and he creates this incredible tapestry in which he evokes the grotesqueries of history, the nightmare that scientific inquiry and experimentation unleashes upon the world in the 20th century. And so to your point, I think it's uh, rather than straight fictional narrative, it's sort of like the creativity of collage and juxtaposition, arrangement, taking all of these found materials and assembling them into a unique, cohesive narrative. And and I agree, it's 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 more than if it's an essay, it's a kind of exploratory literary essay that mm -hmm. uses these disparate forces to convey powerfully. Um, uh, the impact of these radical ideas. Um, well, a text is a tapestry, isn't it? I mean, <clears throat> our word text is related to the word textile. So they're, so weaving is a, a textual practice by its very nature, you know, or, or textual, uh, constructing a text is a kind of weaving, like etymologically true. so. But uh, there's a difference between weaving a text the way he does, at least in this first section and creating a text with completely original characters, right? Oh, um, yeah. In a linear fashion, a, tr a traditional fiction, right? Um, mm -hmm. These things never happen here, are some made up characters, etc. What we have in this first section and throughout are people who actually lived, Hermann Goering, right? In first section, uh, Fritz Haber, right? A, a whole series. Later on, we get into, um, uh, you know, some powerful mathematicians, um, Heisenberg and Schrodinger. So he's taking historical figures and making them his characters, as you will, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's get into some of those uh, characters and I'll follow up with some of my other questions later. Sure. Like, a, like it is, this section, Prussian Blue, is uh, <laughs> about characters like real historical personages <clears throat> and the way they interacted uh with one another or influenced one another in very strange and surprising ways you know like we there are connections among all of these people Hermann Goering as you mentioned 
the German author Heinrich Böll, uh, uh, Hitler, you know, right, and then and then many people that I had never heard of, uh, Karl Bosch, Fritz Haber, as you mentioned, Johann Jakob Diesbach, Johann Lenhard Frisch, uh, and well, Mary Shelley is also mentioned in. I think the reference to her is particularly important because uh, she warned of the risk of the blind advancement of science to her, the right. most dangerous of all human arts. I, I think that's one of the great themes of this book that, uh, you know, science, which is often presented as the cure for all of our ills is anything, but it's often a very dangerous enterprise that leads to more harm than good. And, and in that vein, I think it's also fascinating this first chapter, in addition to having woven together through historical anecdote and detail, all of those different characters, we'll put that in quotations that you just mentioned, right? Those historical figures and um, so on. Prussian blue is also the story of a molecule, interestingly, right? Um, the story of nitrogen, right? And the way in which that itself contains within itself life and death, right? So uh, Fritz Haber, for example, was the first to obtain nitrogen, the main ingredient required from plant growth directly from the air, and that leads to a population explosion, right? But he also was someone who was working on the gas warfare of World War One, right? Um, and so he's telling also the story of this 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 little chemical the, the, the sort of unlocking of its potentialities and the way that that unleashed uh, the capacity for expanding life as well as for mass industri mass destruction on an industrial scale that had not been seen before. And there's the connection with Sebald that you mentioned right. earlier. I don't know if you've read his On the Natural History of Destruction, but uh, I, I definitely detected the influence of that book in particular, and of course that author on Labatu. And did he specifically? Well, in the book, he specifically mentions um, Seval, but does he talk about him in any of those interviews you saw? Um, I believe he does. Um, and then he, uh, what is the Seval book that he the the Rings of Saturn is yes. one that he calls out directly in his acknowledgement page, and mm -hmm. and and, and Seval is a weaver. In the same way I was talking about earlier when I mentioned the artist as weaver, right? And mm -hmm. Labatut is doing something very similar, especially in this first section, right? I mean, Sebald's books, number three or four, I've not read that one, but I've read certainly Rings of Saturn, which is an absolute masterpiece. Yeah. Taking the detritus, you know, the pieces of history and uh, so on, <clears throat> ideas, concepts, historical figures, and weaving them to a tapestry, it's... Uh, it, it's definitely what Sebald is doing here. Well, earlier you mentioned collage, and maybe that's a better image. I, I think the the weaver is is also apt, but there there is a collage aspect too, especially when you think of the rings of Saturn. It's just like all this garbage that is, uh, you know, shaped and composed into a compelling literary narrative. Right. In some ways, an extension of the modernist project, right? I mean, if you think of, I don't know, uh, the 100 year anniversary of the wasteland, right? And uh, T.S. Eliot taking the different fragments, right, from his mind and from European history and melding them into this weird thing, um, pounded similar stuff. A lot of the modernists were, were thinking in those terms. This is, in many ways, a sort of extension of that, that modernist project. And, and, you know, the modernists who were producing complicated forms of literature, right? Um, and, and I think that this book is an offspring in many ways, right? A grandchild of that. The Wasteland, you mean that ripoff of James Joyce's Ulysses? <laughs> That's right, exactly. exactly. It's itself a ripoff of uh, Homer and so on, right? But maybe, yeah. maybe we could look at the opening uh, as a way to dive into some of these historical figures. Uh, just talk about that. You know, he begins with this opening anecdote uh, and I'd be curious to think about, hear your thoughts about it. And it, it, I'll just read the first couple of sentences, um, and then maybe we can use that as a launch into the chapter. Mm -hmm. um, but 
we begin with this. In, in a medical examination on the eve of the Nuremberg trials, the doctors found the nails of Hermann Goering's fingers and toes stained a furious red, the consequence of his addiction to dihydrocodine, an analgesic of which he took more than 100 pills a day. William Burroughs described it as similar to heroin, twice as strong as codeine, but with a wired Coke-like edge. So the North American doctors felt obliged to cure Goering of his dependency before allowing him to stand before the court. So we begin with this drug-addled Nazi. Later we hear that his fingers and toes were stained a curious red, the consequence of his addiction, as we mentioned. That, that image of that furious red, I think, sort of sets off the book, doesn't it? Um, uh, this furious red, contamination by chemicals, addiction to pharmaceuticals, uh, the death cult of Nazism. And then we hear later that methamphetamine was part of the common soldier's rations, right? So, Well, it, it, yeah, it was, it was uh, specifically marketed as pervitin which right. uh, I didn't know about. But yeah, it's a kind of meth. Right. Which is, uh, I mean, I had heard rumors of that, but I'd never heard it described so explicitly, you know? <clears throat> right. And, and he goes on from this opening to weave in these anecdotes that are so powerful that it's as if to add anything to them, to embellish them in any way would be pointless because what happens alone is so fantastical and grotesque and mind-boggling he just tells what happened and then makes a connection with another sort of historical incident right so here's one other example um on uh, a little bit later early on in the caps we hear about the wave of suicides that consumed germany after it's clear that the third reich is falling right and then we hear about <laughs> the officers and, um of the nazi party committing suicide, there's cyanide capsules being handed out by the Berlin Philharmonic before the day fell. This is April of 1945. And this is astounding to me that this actually happened. They're listening to Wagner's Götterdammerung, right? The Twilight of the Gods mm -hmm. before chewing on cyanide capsules. And he spends a couple of pages, in which seems to be absolute madness. And then you're reminded that this actually happened somehow, right? Uh, when the audience filed towards the exits, Bruno Held's cries of pain still resounding in their ears, members of the Deutsches Jungvolk, a section of the Hitler youth composed of children under 10, as the teenagers were already off dying at the barricades, handed out cyanide capsules in small wicker baskets like votive offerings at mass. And so you have all of these Nazi leaders committing mass suicide while listening to Wagner as the Valkyrie immolates herself on an enormous funeral pyre. It's a insane staging, right, of their suicide, right? This dying for the fatherland, going down in flames, but the way that they add that aesthetic gloss to it, right, with Wagner in the background, the, the children handing out the capsules. This is staggering, right? Uh, mm. So it's those sorts of little anecdotes that he unearths and he just puts them all together in this 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 uh, tapestry collage, whatever you want to call it. Well, and he connects them because cyanide itself, these cyanide capsules that they that they chew to, you know, immolate themselves, as you say, w what is cyanide? It's it's basically a byproduct. I'm quoting here, a byproduct isolated in 1782 from the first modern synthetic pigment, Prussian blue. So he's, right. he starts with the mass suicide of the Nazis, uh, you know, chomping down on these cyanide tablets. <clears throat> and then he explains how this is connected to the first modern synthetic pigment, Prussian blue, the title of the story. Uh, and Prussian blue also has its own backstory right but 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 uh you know in liquid form it, it uh it was called blauzoira which is blue acid right blauzoira in german blue acid is the translation and this is why at auschwitz for example the the bricks are stained blue right you know, they were gassing people with this 
with this cyanide uh, byproduct. Well, I guess uh, the Zyklon B was it, which is yes, that's the right. German word for cyclone, right? That's a cy- right. cyanide derivative, right? But but then you see, oh, it actually came from this Prussian blue, which was used by painters. So there's a very disturbing connection between the arts and the sciences and, and, you know, militarism and the Nazi death cult. Right. So this, this uh, Prussian blue uh, replaced ult- ultramarine as a cheaper blue alternative for painters, such as uh, Van Gogh. I mean, Van right. Gogh's Starry Night has this Prussian blue and, and even it's used even as far away as Japan, Hokusai's Great Wave, you know, the famous uh, painting of the Great Wave. That's Hokusai, right. Hokusai, the Japanese master. He also is using this uh, Prussian blue as a, as a painter. And, it, and then we find it appears on uniforms of the infantrymen of the Prussian army as though something in the color's chemical structure invoked violence. Yeah, that's a beautiful little quote right there. And so that that's exactly what I'm talking about in terms of my being blown away by this 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 weaving, right? That like you just mentioned. First of all, you know, Prussian blue was an accidental discovery, right? Uh it's this new man-made color. Uh men were exploring color possibilities for the purposes of commerce and the benefits of visual art. And then as you said, an ingredient in that elixir eventually produces the blue that you see in Van Gogh's Starry Night, he says, the waters of Hokusu's Great Wave. And then there's that next connection, right? But also on the uniforms of the infantry, men of the Prussian army, as though something in the color's chemical structure invoked violence. So those kinds of connections are what make this more than just a Wikipedia rec- reciting of facts, right? Oh, yeah. the, the, the artist here has found these different pieces strung them together um, to convey a chilling, unique fiction. One of the things that uh, Labatut says about fiction is that it can give us what history can't give us. History alone can't give us meaning, but fiction and the imagination is what gives us meaning, right? Um, Well, yes, it it requires the artist to make all of these connections. Otherwise, as you say, it would just be a Wikipedia article or a recitation of facts. Like he's the one making the connections and and connecting all the dots, as it were. And conveying this this story about the way this chemical contains life and death, the way that accidental discoveries can lead to aesthetic masterpieces and mass destruction, right? And that these things are happening almost outside of human control, right? uh, you know, he he called himself in one of the interviews I listened to also an epiphany junkie. I love that phrase. Oh. I am most interested in epiphany, epiphany junkie. And so I feel like that's sort of the what he induced in me, certainly, when I was mm. reading about these connections we're talking about, taking these different strands and facts and putting them together. Suddenly, like, boom, there's that epiphany, right? That this well, color. Every, yeah, every connection every one of these connections that we're mentioning is an epiphany. Right. Exactly. I, I, that's, that's, I'm, I'm happy to hear that he referred to himself that way. That means he's a Joycean. Um, let, let, let's go back and, sure. and talk about the, the origin of Prussian blue, which you say yeah. was an accident. Right. So we've got this, uh, scientist or, uh, I don't know, chemist, Johann, Jakob Diesbach, how does he discover Prussian blue? It's a total accident. He's trying to find a ruby red alternative so that, you know, the the Prussians can challenge the Spanish monopoly on carmine. Right. And and why why do the Spaniards have this? Because they harvested these female coquineals, small parasitic insects that grow on the nopal cactus in Mexico and in Central and South America. Wow, that is astounding, you know. Exactly. It's, it's like, okay, so, <clears throat> and, and and that too is a complete accident, right? Like the Spanish, they just happen to uh, be, to colonize that part of the world 
it could have it could have easily have been the portuguese or the right. english or the germans or anyone you know it just happened to be the spanish so they by accident they find these these uh, parasitic insects that create this that or or what yield this this uh deep ruby red color that is so valued by other people you know right which in itself is it leads one to speculate like what why was that so valuable like financially and economically it's just a color you know like a it's just a, a substance why do we value things like specific colors why do we value gold more than silver like we right. we just like shiny things or colorful right. things but but um this uh this accident uh led him to think well, let's see what he did. He's 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 trying to find that red, and he so one of his experiments is to pour pot ash on uh, another chemist, Johann Conrad Dippel's distillation of animal parts. And we get this first. We're told about this about Diesbach first. Then later we find out what this crazy guy Johann Conrad Dippel did with the animal parts. You know, right. Yeah. We, we we're still waiting to hear what that's about but he he pours potash on that trying to create this red color and in the end he thinks he has discovered his idiot which is the original color of the sky the legendary blue used by the egyptians to adorn the skin of their gods another astonishing fact so like when we see ancient egyptian you know, uh, artwork, and we see the blue, this is what he thought he was discovering, the original and, color of the sky. And in the context of scientific discovery, right, um, there's this wonderful sentence where Labatut tells us that this occurred in a time when chemistry had not yet branched away from alchemy. Yes. And the compounds known by a myriad of arcane names, such as bismuth, vitriol, cinnabar, and amalgam were a hatchery for unexpected often happy accidents it's a beautiful sentence in itself well, right and but that absolutely. notion of unexpected happy accidents uh you know it, it it's two-sided these happy accidents also lead to very unhappy accidents right and unhappy yeah. unexpected uses of these compounds right um but but yes this notion that scientific discovery is oftentimes the result of uh chance well for sure yeah oh and this is why it it reminded me of another book i read two years ago bill bryson's the body uh like it of course the focus is the human body and what we know about it but uh the the narrative consists of a kind of history of medical science and like everything that the modern world takes for granted medically you know uh is complete accident from the discovery of penicillin to anything else you can think of it's all chance it's all accidental uh and again we certainly see that here in the prussian blue narrative um i wanted yeah. to also point out just uh to follow up on the Diesbach, on my my note related to Diesbach, he this accidental discovery he calls Prussian blue. Why to honor the empire that would surpass the glory of the ancients? So you know his scientific endeavors were in his mind in the service of his motherland. You know right. he wanted so like. And this, I think this is what Labatut is telling us about science. First of all, uh, I think he might agree that even though he says chemistry had not yet branched away from alchemy, I think he would raise the question, has it ever? I mean, is is chemistry really separate from alchemy or are we or are we still do we just think it is? We think, oh, we're so sophisticated. We're so scientific. Are we, though? And and look at how scientific research is funded right it's often in the service of some sort of 
empire or or you know nation state or it often has a military purpose exactly and i think i think this is also a story it's a story about many things but also a story about the increasingly malignant effects of nationalism certainly and we know that from the very beginning because we begin with the crumbling of europe right and the uh, uh the destruction of the nazis and uh um, the European continent as a kind of wasteland. And certainly we see that in other sections of this book, which we'll get to later, right? When he looks at quantum physics and um, what those discoveries unleashed upon the world and so on, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, in the second section, which we'll look at next time, where uh, in World War I, where Schwarzschild discovers basically the black hole and he makes associations between that and um, uh, the dangers of nationalism and so on, right? Um, you know, if we go back to these, these accidental discoveries, um, the next person on the list would be, I guess, Carl Wilhelm Scheel. And we get this, uh, in terms of the way that cyanide was accidentally discovered from Prussian blue, uh, uh, we're told the following that the chemist who discovered cyanide experienced, uh, this danger firsthand in 1782, Carl Wilhelm Scheel stirred a pot of Prussian blue with a spoon coated in traces of sulfuric acid and created the most potent poison of the modern era. He named this new compound Prussic acid and was immediately aware of the enormous potential of its hyperreactivity. What he could not imagine was that 200 years after his death, well into the 21st century, its industrial, medical, and chemical applications would be such that each month, a sufficient quantity would be manufactured manufactured to poison every person on the planet. So here again, we have a complete accidental discovery, right? Well, Prussian blue was discovered a... accidentally. And then this guy happened to stir a pot of it with this spoon, which had traces of sulfuric acid. And then boom, there's cyanide. Well, um, and that's the, that's the Blauzeura, the blue acid that I... Uh, alluded to before but actually uh the stuff that he discovers turns a different color right so yeah. so diesbach color <laughs> it's the the history of colors is interesting too you know diesbach is looking for red he accidentally discovers this prussian blue and then sheila while playing around with this prussian blue uh accidentally discovers an arsenic based pigment which is an emerald green so dazzling and seductive it became napoleon's favorite color and and so like the the uh it talks about napoleon's uh exile on uh what was the name of that island saint helena is it yeah that's right so you know he he died of a mysterious cancer and rather rapidly. And then a lot of the, the uh, servants that were housed with him during his exile also died of horrific cancers, you know, and they, they link it back to this arsenic based pigment, the emerald right. green that, that Sheila discovered again by accident. Right. Yeah, there's a beautiful passage later in the section where he's talking about he contrasts arsenic and cyanide yeah um and he uses these wonderful little metaphors um uh, he says if arsenic is a patient assassin hiding out in the most recondite of the body's tissues and accumulating there for years cyanide takes your breath away creating the quote unquote audible gasp that made it a favorite of countless assassins. And we're told that that's, uh, it was used against Rasputin among others and so on, right? Um, and, this, and this leads him to, yes, exactly. This leads him to make yet another connection with Rasputin who is apparently immune to cyanide. They, they tried to poison him with cyanide and didn't work. But Alan Turing, the uh, famous uh, British scientist who you know, was forced to undergo chemical Kep castration right. uh, to supposedly cure him of his homosexuality. He, like Snow White, allegedly bit 
a poisoned apple and that apple was poisoned with cyanide. Right. So, so again, another example of exactly what we've been talking about, the way in which this man, our author, has obsessively researched the history of chemicals, um, you know, pigmentation, scientific discovery, the people behind them, um, and taken all of these disparate elements and, and, and made them into this very strange and ominous whole that is just the first part of this book, right? Um, chapter one, Prussian blue. Well, it emphasizes the interconnectedness of us all. You know, a chance discovery in the 18th century in <clears throat> Prussia has these wide ranging consequences. You know, it affects it affects Napoleon. It affects Alan Turing in the British Isles. It affects, you know, the the Nazi war machine. It it has an effect on Rasputin in Russia. Well, it doesn't have an effect on him apparently, but you know, people were still trying to use it to achieve a certain effect. Right. So it's like <clears throat> there there's nothing that happens that doesn't affect everyone it's like that butterfly effect that right is is spoken of in popular culture right indeed yeah the, the, yeah. the slightest little change in the delicate balance of whatever we think our world is has <clears throat> far ranging consequences you know with all that in mind i wonder if we could now might be a good chance to shift to the last part of this chapter where we get to I don't know if I would call him the protagonist, right? But but certainly the the last figure he spends talking about, um, and maybe maybe the most central in this first part is Fritz Haber, mm -hmm. the Jewish chemist, uh, and uh, the man who pulled bread from the air, right? The Haber Bosch process, um, which he says Labatut is the most important chemical discovery of the twentieth century, right? Um, in pulling nitrogen from the air, that was able to yield mass agricultural gains and um uh so on but uh why don't we shift to that and maybe conclude by talking about him and what we're left with here at the end of the chapter well if we're talking about him as an individual the contradictions are apparent in this simple description <clears throat> he was declared a war criminal by the allies but he also wins the nobel prize for being the first person to obtain nitrogen, the main ingredient or the main nutrient required for plant growth directly from the air. As you said, he pulled bread from air. So uh, again, it's, uh, it's like the, the dual nature of all of these scientific discoveries are embodied in this one individual, right? They're apparently beneficial uses, although even the we find out later that even pulling bread from the air has its negative consequences, right? But right. it was at the time thought to be primarily beneficial because it fed people that otherwise would not have, you know, been able to feed themselves. But at the same time, he's called the father of this new, you know, method of war namely gas you know basically chemical warfare he's yeah the father and, of chemical warfare and so here we we move into world war one which lots of historians talk about as the the turning point into for lack of a better word the modern world right world war one was the first war which featured mechanized warfare trench warfare tanks right machine guns uh, barbed wire, and of course the horrors of gas warfare, which were then outlawed for World War II, which didn't prevent the Nazis from gassing uh, the Jewish population, of course, right? Uh, but yes, here we have Fritz Haber, well, who is... Or, or, you know, the the Allies using gas in their own attacks. Right? Oh, of course, of course, of course. So so we end with Fritz Haber, right? This, this man of contradictions, you know, his wife also a powerful... Uh, Clara Immerwahl, apparently, and we're told she was the first woman to receive the doctorate in chemistry at a German university, who is so horrified by 
her husband's uh, work in chemical warfare and helping to orchestrate that, that she commits suicide. So we have the personal costs, right, of, of, of working for a war machine, I suppose, right? Mm -hmm. um, he, he becomes a kind of tragic figure, a man of contradiction, pulling bread from the air, but also um, uh, we're told that his nitrogen allowed the European conflict to drag on for two more years, right? You can feed more people, right, um, with, with increases in agriculture. And so uh, that exponential growth of life also leads to mass casualties on each side by several millions, we're told, right? And that's sort of what, again, these, these contradictions are, 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 are what uh, Lavatut's exploring here, right? Um, accidental discoveries, artistic innovations, mass destruction, uh, et cetera. And so well, we end with, with this man, Haber. Well, and his discovery is also accidental, right? Like right. He, he needs nitrogen for fertilizer. Uh, before that, they, this is crazy. They were, they were tomb raiding. Uh, they were like raiding tombs to obtain and, and uh, pillaging buffalo carcasses to right. obtain something called bone black, which was the darkest pigment available at the time. Uh, and they were using, they were trying to obtain nitrogen that way. And and why was it necessary for Germany to go in search of other sources of nitrogen? Because the English fleet had blocked Germany's access to Chilean nitrate. Right. So again, right. again, right. it's it's due to this imperialism and these competing interests of world powers. That that that's like the driving force behind these accidental scientific discoveries that have good and bad consequences, and I think he's saying mostly bad. Like, yeah, I like it's, definitely. It's it, like for whatever benefit we get, you know, the the negative consequences out outweigh them significantly. But um, uh, it's just like the as you say, the nationalism and the imperialism, they, they always lead to these horrific consequences. And e even though, you know, they're justified in the name of some kind of scientific breakthrough, like in the end, they often don't benefit us. Yeah. And then I think another unhappy accident, perhaps, you know, when we talk about the intersection between scientific discovery and rabid nationalism and mass destruction. We begin the chapter with the dying of the Nazis and Hermann Goering's fingernails and mass suicides. Um, by the time we get to the end of the chapter and we're in World War I, and he's talking about Fritz Haber and gas warfare, we hear about a young 25 aspiring artist, a young cadet, affectionately called Adi by his comrades. And we get two pages about this young man who happened to be there in Belgium during the massacre of the innocents uh, at, I don't know how to pronounce it, Ypres, Belgium. Anyway, I know, I know that that's like this moment right in time. Um, uh, the way in which 40,000 young enlistees lost their lives in only 20 days. He was there and we get two pages on this guy and learn at the end, ah, this is the one who later would plan his vengeance from prison in a book that described his personal struggle and outlined a plan to raise Germany above all the nations of the world, something he was prepared to do with his own hands should it prove necessary. In the interwar years, while Adi climbed the summit of the National Socialist Workers' Party, shouting the racist and anti-Semitic harangues that would eventually see him crowned Führer of all Germany, Fritz Hopper was making his own efforts to restore his homeland's tarnished glory. So. The, the seed for Hitler himself and the rise of Nazism is planted in this mass destruction of World War I and then the post-war Germanic grievances that Hitler ex exploits to consolidate power and dissolve the Weimar Republic, right, which only existed about 11 years, um, uh, to unleash even greater horror upon the world later. Well, uh, he himself was blinded in a mustard gas attack right. by the English. So it had a very personal effect on him. And I think uh, 
did I did I read that here? He You did, uh, I believe. Yes. He no, but I mean he was like opposed to this kind of chemical warfare. And you know, he was not like he was not like keen to develop the uh the atomic uh energy program either. Like he he found that to be <laughs> Oddly enough, he found that to be barbaric. Right, right. Interestingly, barbaric for mass warfare, but not certainly not too barbaric to exterminate yeah, the exactly. plague that were the Jews, right? Right, right. Well, uh, the way he introduces us to this anonymous soldier, this failed artist, and and then reveals as you say like two pages later oh this is hitler we're talking right. about i mean it's it's brilliant the way he weaves that into the narrative you know you just don't you can't imagine where one at the beginning of that section you can't imagine where it's going but then there are these little hints like adi adi that sounds familiar yeah oh, right adi is adolf hitler right right wow. right right indeed so i wonder now if like if we look at all of what we've been talking about, oh, reader out there, which, which I'm sure we've impressed upon you, makes this so remarkable, is that everything we're talking about, none of that was made up, right? Everything are these different little disparate little facts, you know, and, and, and so on, um, that have been woven into this incredible tapestry, except for, Labatut himself says this, the final, the final uh, uh, paragraph of the chapter. He says, that's the only time that I fictionalized. Right. Um, and let's I wonder if we could maybe that now. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so the final, not, not the final chapter, excuse me, the final paragraph of the, of the, which is set off of his own sections. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've heard all about Haber and so on and his death. And, um, uh, <laughs> we get this horrible stuff that, you know, Haber dies in 1934. Um, not knowing that years later the Nazis would use in their gas chambers the pesticide he had helped to create to murder his half-sister, his brother-in-law, his nephews, and countless other Jews who had died hunkered down. Um, okay, we get all that, and then we get this last paragraph, and we hear, among the few possessions Fritz Haber had with him when he died was a letter written to his wife. In it, he confessed that he felt an unbearable guilt, not for the part he had played directly or indirectly in the death of untold human beings. That part but because, didn't bother him. No, that didn't bother him. That didn't bother him. But what did bother him is his method of extracting nitrogen from the air that had so altered the natural equilibrium of the planet that he feared the world's future belonged not to mankind, but to plants. Is all that was needed was a drop in population to pre-modern levels for just a few decades to allow them to grow without limit taking advantage of the excess nutrients humanity had bestowed upon them to spread out across the earth and cover it completely, suffocating all forms of life beneath a terrible verdure. So there's, the, that, there's the one element of fiction. And let me, let me turn things over to you. Um, what are your thoughts about that in terms of this? We've had this incredible tapestry that feels fantastical, and yet it's basically strands of history woven together right and then we have this last made up part what comes to mind for you there well i mean first of all i'll say i think of the five sections in the book this is my favorite and maybe it's because most of it apart from that last paragraph you just read is factual you know like he he still creates this beautiful tapestry, this uh, mesmerizing collage, but it's all historically accurate. You know, there was no, all he had to do was tease out the connections. All he had to do was connect the dots. All he had to do was like, uh, show us how all of these disparate elements are incredibly related i mean it's a, it's just astounding it's an astounding uh work of research and also imagination in the way that he 
connects everything. So I think that's why my fa why this is my favorite section. But that last paragraph, I think the purpose of it in terms of his narrative, like artistically, this is to connect it with the final section of the book, The Night Gardener. Right. You know? I think it's a kind of, it's almost an afterthought, like the, the narrative actually ends before that last paragraph, but when he uh, incorporated it into this book of five narratives, he needed some kind of connective tissue, as it were. And so he, you know, I, I, I wonder how much of that is really fictionalized. Like, it's easy to imagine Haber as he's presented by Lavatut having such thoughts like, oh, yeah, I mean, I guess it was unfortunate that that uh, my invention was used to murder all those people. But what I'm really horrified by is the possibility that like like vegetation is going to overtake humanity. And isn't that a way for him to also indict science, scientific inquiry divorced from morality, right? He doesn't care in Labatut's imagining. Haber doesn't care about his own guilt, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. For the deaths that he caused through, you know, gas warfare. Even though his wife and ended up committing suicide, right? Yes. In, in protest. Like that, that and what, his what, own what family matters is, was murdered by his invention, you know? Right, right. And and then his it's 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 the the worry that vegetation will sort of overtake and and, and basically topple humanity from uh its apex, right? You know, as the sort of uh, uh most powerful chosen species. There's a kind of bias towards humans right um there's still a kind of hierarchical thinking there in his well, mind even, I, even then i wonder like would this fictionalized haber actually be concerned that humanity would be overtaken or just germany you know right exactly like exactly like, like i think oh, the latter if, it, if yeah if if vegetation wipes out india and africa and you know China, well, fuck them. But what if it? What if it uh, overtakes like Europe and Germany in particular? Right. Our, our, we were the pinnacle of human achievement. You right, know? right. The the last thing I'll say is that in addition to that last paragraph connecting to the final section, the Night Gardener, we'll we'll explain that later. Certainly, uh, mm -hmm. you know, without giving anything away about the last section, it does feature uh, the the last image of the book features. The, the kind of mad proliferation of, 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 uh, of nature, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, this last line, you know, where Haber is imagined as being haunted by this greenness covering the earth completely beneath a terrible verdure, the Spanish title, in other words, the original title is yeah. Un Verdor Terrible, right? Mm. It's not when we cease to understand the world. That was the English, that's what they used in English. And he really? talks about that in one of his interviews, why 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 he he likes the English translation, but it's un verdor terrible, which I guess you could translate as a terrible greenness. Terrible and so the whole nurture. if we think about yeah. if we think about that and the wonderful meanings of that phrase, right? Greenness can mean among other things uh, a kind of terrible naivete, right? The naivete of scientific discovery, the 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 it, that leads to terrible, unforeseen consequences. The notion that scientific breakthrough is always going to advance human progress and make us all better. It's a, it's a boon for humanity and for the world. Um, when in fact, no, right? This first section has shown that it's not. Often it's just the opposite, right? So I think that might be one of the meanings of this terrible greenness. So that's the original title in yes. Spanish for the Un entire book. Terrible. For the entire book. Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. That's right. Quite, that's quite different, you know. That's it is quite very, different. Very different. Well, what do you, we've got about five minutes there. What do you think about the translation? Did you read the original Spanish? I did not. Um, okay. I, t I did read interviews with the author. He is a, he is fluent in English. Listening to him speak. You would not guess. There's no accent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, he's very pleased with the translation. Mm -hmm. So I've not read it in Spanish. I see. I'm, I'm tempted to get it in Spanish. 
Um, but uh, um, that's all I can say, really, right? I know that yeah. the author himself was pleased with the translation. Okay, well, uh, have you read any of his other works? I mean, I he, have has he uh, neither of the other else? two. He has two, two other works, mm -hmm. um, and neither of them are translated into English. And I tried finding one in Spanish, and I was... I, I found it difficult to do so. They are both acclaimed pretty well, right? Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, what are his other works? Let me look this up real fast. Um, as you're doing love... that, as you're doing that, I'll just ask one final question. You earlier mentioned, in addition to Sebalt as being an influence, you mentioned Bolaño, and that that connection was not as obvious to me. What what do you see in his work that reminds you of the work of Bolaño. I think I see in his work, first of all, he praised Bolaño among other writers that he really admires. But mm -hmm. I think I think he really liked the way that Bolaño was working within and kind of shattering literary forms. Um, you know, when Lavatut talked about his disdain for traditional storytelling, how can you tell a straight narrative in a world as twisted as ours, right? Mm -hmm. When I think of Bolaño and certainly the, the the two big masterpieces, two six 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 and the Savage Detectives, you have a series of narratives, a series of narrators um, on the hand of, uh, you know, in the case of the Savage Detectives, and then in the case of uh, um, two six six six, which we both read, five different sections, kind of like on mammoth scale, it's almost a thousand pages, but they are different narratives, and within each of those narratives right you have a multiplicity of characters it breaks into more narratives right mm -hmm. and so i think that's probably what he was referring to when blah, blah too when he says he said an interesting thing one time like when you innovate against form he says you have to be humble because those forms came before you so he's someone who's interested in defying forms right um mm -hmm. while also being aware of working within them so that might be the connection to Bolaño. I see. Well, we're almost up on an hour, so we should probably end it here. Uh, this was a very in-depth discussion of Prussian Blue, the first section of Benjamin Labatut's When We Cease to Understand the World. And for episode two, we will discuss the second section of this book, and that is Schwarzschild's Singularity. Schwarzschild, I think. Schwarz, Schwarzschild. Schwarzschild. We'll yeah, you're right. Schwarzschild. Yeah, maybe that's Schwarz, how you pronounce it. Schwarzschild. Schwarzschild. Black, Black right. shield, just like Rothschild is red shield, right? Right. So, so we'll yeah. be discussing, uh, yeah, in that section, this is the guy who had the first exact solution to the equations of general relativity, which he solved while he was serving in World War I, right? So we again begin with the confluence of science and mass destruction and warfare. Anyway, more to come. Dear reader, if you've not read this book, dive into it. If you have, we hope that this is illuminating. We certainly found this uh, incredibly provocative and I'll look forward to next time, Mark Will. Okay, GJ Via, talk to you soon. Later. And book burners, we will see you next time. Bye-bye.